Um, our two speakers tonight, uh, on my left is Dr. Kent Hoven. He has a PhD in Christian education from Patriot University. And on my right is Jamin. Jamin has a uh, Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of St. Scholastica and also a Bachelor of Arts in English, also from St. Scholastica. Uh, Dr. Hoven, if I can ask you to open by giving your testimony briefly. Sir. Uh, my name is Kent Hovind. I was born and raised in East Peoria, Illinois. I was a high school science teacher for 15 years, and now for 15 years I've been an evangelist doing seminars on creation. Uh, when I was, I was born into the, our family was Lutheran and was baptized as a baby. At least they sprinkled water on my empty head. And then we switched over to Mennonite church for <clears throat> quite a while, six or seven, eight, eight or nine years. And then I went to an extremely liberal Methodist church. And when I was 16 years old, a friend of mine asked me if I was going to heaven. I said, well, I've been baptized and catechized and pasteurized and homogenized, you know. What else is there? <laughs> he said, are you going to heaven? I said, I don't have a clue. And he witnessed to me, and I rejected Christ that day, but uh, I thought about it. For the next month or so, I was bothered about it. And then, in the meantime, the Navigator's Bible Study Group witnessed to my older brother and got him saved down at Illinois State University. And he got concerned about his little brother and invited me down to spend the weekend with him and got witnessed to for the second time. And I said, okay, I'm ready. And I uh, accepted Christ as my Savior, February 9th, 1969, at age 16. Gave my heart to the Lord. Came back to uh, East Peoria, my hometown there. And uh, the next day at school, a uh, Christian who'd been trying to get me to work on me uh, invited me to uh, double date with him so he could try to disciple me. And the girl that he brought on the date uh, brought me to her church. It was an independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist church. I had never been to a Baptist church before. It was a new experience for me. The preacher actually banged on the pulpit. I had never seen that before. Uh, <laughs> and so I fell in love with it and began studying the Bible and reading avidly and uh, majored in math and science and ended up teaching for years and loved the two subjects. And uh, so I gave my heart to the Lord 35 years ago, and I, my whole desire is to, to please Him and, and serve Him with my life. Thank you. How's this? Okay. My name is Jamin Dick, and I grew up around here and up in Anoka. I was blessed with... Uh, godly family that um, taught me from a young age about the Word of God, and um, I knew the truth of God growing up, but I, I didn't have an experience of faith until I was um, in college. And this issue actually was very important to me uh, since the time I could look up at the sky and point out constellations, which was pretty young. And uh, so it was very high interest to me, but by about the time I was in college, I was really struggling with some of the uh, some of the differences between what I saw in science and what the Bible apparently taught. And in fact, it was what my church taught and what many in, in my community of believers taught. And so I, I had just not thought about it much more than that until uh, my first year in college. And uh, I started to investigate more, and I found that actually there was not as much unanimity on this subject as I had previously thought, that there actually were many believers, many conservative believers, who uh, had reconciled this issue to some degree for themselves. And that was encouraging to me, um, because I didn't want to have unnecessary stumbling blocks in my way. Ultimately, uh, I never changed my view that the Bible is infallible and the absolutely authoritative Word of God, and I believe that to this day. I just believe that it's also in harmony with what we see in nature. And I hope tonight to um, do some justice to that position, and I'm glad to be here. So thank you, Dr. Hoven, for coming down to, to debate me. Dr. Hoven, if you'd give your 10-minute opening statement. All right. Well, it's an honor to be here. I wish it was a little warmer. I just flew out of Florida this morning. Uh, I'll pray for you folks when I get home uh, tomorrow. Uh, my name is Kent Hoven. As I said, I taught high school science 15 years, and uh, my wife and I have been married 30 years, 30 and a half. We have three kids, one of each, and we have them all married off, and the dog died, so I made it. I'm home free, and two grandkids, and one more coming. 
It's exciting. Grandkids are God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. <laughs> I also firmly believe there absolutely is no conflict between science and the Bible. Uh, there is no conflict between what we see in nature and God's clear revealed Word. Now there's a severe conflict between the age of the earth that's taught in the science textbooks, you know, being billions of years old, and the Bible. There's a conflict between that, I think, and that's what we're going to address tonight. The Bible says, Jesus is talking here, Colossians chapter 1, by Him were all things created, or Jesus, talking about Jesus, all things were created by Him and for Him. Well, if Jesus is the Creator, He's God Almighty in the flesh, then He probably should know when He did it, okay? And Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Was that really the beginning? Was Jesus wrong? Was He lying? Was He confused about scientific evidence? Did He not know about the age of the earth? Mark 10, 6, From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. The Bible says by one man, talking about Adam, one man's sin entered the world, and death by sin. The reason we have death in this world is because of Adam's sin. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. 1 Corinthians 15, By man came death, in Adam all die. The reason we have death in the world is because of man's sin. The age-old question, why is there suffering in the world, is answered in the Scriptures. There's suffering because of man's disobedience to God. The evolution theory and the old earth position both teach man came Long after death was already here before man got here. The evolution theory teaches death actually brought man into the world. The Bible says man brought death into the world. These two views are polar opposite. Somebody's wrong. Okay? And I enjoy showing them who they are. Okay. Uh, the Bible says Adam was the first man. It's real clear about that. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son and named him Seth. Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. You go through the Bible, you add up the dates. Anybody can do it. Thousands have done it over the centuries. And you're going to get about 6,000 years for the age of the universe. Everything created in six days. No death till Adam sinned. The dates add up to 4,000 B.C., plus or minus a few hundred. I mean, it's just, it's a no-brainer. 6,000 years ago was the creation. And then, of course, the corruption and the curse. And then the catastrophe, the flood, 4,400 years ago. Those who teach the earth is billions of years old, invariably, I've never met an exception to this. I don't know about Jamin. We'll find out in a little bit. Invariably, they, they teach it was a local flood in the days of Noah. Because if it was a worldwide flood it would erase all evidence of the billions of years that they're counting on. They think the geologic column teaches billions of years, and the flood would have erased all that. So I've never met one that's different. They all say it was just a local flood. When I asked Hugh Ross, I said, do you believe in a universal flood, a, a, a worldwide flood? He said, I believe in a universal flood. That's a deceitful answer. I said, what do you mean universal flood? He said, well, it flooded Noah's little universe, the valley he lived in. I said, then why don't you tell people you don't believe in a worldwide flood? Why would you use the word universal? That's deceitful. Tell people you believe in a local flood. And why would God tell Noah to build a boat 450 feet long, fill it full of animals, and stay in there for a year if it's a local flood? Tell Noah to move. <laughs> uh, duh. Anyway. The time before the flood was very, very different. During that time, people lived over 900 years. This is what the Bible clearly teaches. Now, there are two compromised positions that try to put billions of years into the Bible. One is called the gap theory. I will skip that tonight unless Jamin brings that up. I'm prepared for that one. The other is called the day-age theory, which is what Hugh Ross and Don Stoner and Gerald Schroeder and those people teach. Um, he has a ministry called Reasons to Believe. I have read much of his work, and I come away wondering, Reasons to Believe what? It's not reasons to believe the Bible. It's reasons to believe Hugh Ross. I debated him for three hours. He won't do it again. I'd be glad to do it again. But were the days really long periods of time? This is the living Bible. It says, Let the earth burst forth with every sort of grass and seed-bearing plant and fruit trees. All this occurred on the third day. It uses the word T-H-E, the, which is the definite article. But that, he's got a footnote that says, These might be long periods of time. Are they long periods of time? Psalm 90 says a thousand years is like yesterday. So, uh, 2 Peter 3 says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Is it possible the days of creation are not literal 24-hour days? Well, the Farrar Fenton Bible back in 1903 said, By periods God created that which produced the solar systems, then that which produced the earth. He's trying awful hard to say these days aren't really days, okay? He said this was the close in the dawn of the first age, the close in the dawn of the second age. 
The problem is the Frar Fenton Bible and many of the new versions of the Bible today are taken from the Alexandrian manuscript which tried to change the creation days, not from the Texas Receptus. That's another long story. On the third day, the Bible clearly tells us the herbs, the grass, and the trees were made on the third day. On the fourth day, he made the lights, the sun, moon, and stars. Now, evolution theory has the sun being created before the earth. The Bible has the earth being created before the sun. These views are not reconcilable. And by the way, if the days are long periods of time, them trees are going to die waiting for that sun to come up. Okay? And on the fifth day, he made the insects. Insects are essential to pollinate plants. It is not logical to say that the Genesis account teaches long periods of time because the order of creation clearly precludes that. He had the... Um, Plants made, then the sun, then the insects. God's telling us very clearly it was six days. And James Barr, professor of Hebrew at, Ox at Vanderbilt, said no professor of Hebrew of any world-class university who does not believe the writers of Genesis intended to convey to their readers the idea the creation took place in the six days which were the same as the days we now enjoy. And he goes on, we could talk for hours about that. But there are no verses in the Bible where the word yam means anything other than a normal 24-hour day when it's modified by a number like the second day, etc., Hebrew word for yom is, and is, is yom, and normally means a solar day. It can also be used as an indefinite period of time, like in the days of Noah, or it can also be, indicate just the lighted portion of the day, 12 hours, okay? But when yom is used with modifiers, evening and morning, it always means a solar day. The words evening, used 52 times, and morning, used 220 times, elsewhere in the Old Testament, always refer to a normal day. Also, when yom is used with numbers, such as the first, second, or third, it always refers to a solar day. This happens over 200 times in the Old Testament. And he said, three days' journey betwixt him and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Could this mean 3,000 or 3 billion years? In three days, Pharaoh shall restore thy head and shall restore thee unto thy place. Could that be billions of years? In three days, Pharaoh will lift up thy head from off thee. He's going to kill you. Did he mean billions of years in that case? He put them in all into ward for three days. Could that be billions of years? They spent a long time in jail, didn't they? God, said, God, the, God of the Hebrews said, let us go three days' journey into the wilderness. Could that be billions of years? Moses stretched forth his hand, and there was darkness in the land of Egypt three days. Could that be billions of years? Or is it obviously three days? Okay. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Is that billions of years? Um, Jesus was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Was he in the grave for millions of years? It's quite obviously three days. Okay. Jesus said to his disciples, you continue with me now. Three, these guys have been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Was he talking about billions of years in that case? You can go through the Bible and find thousands of references to this, folks. It always means days. When it's got a number with it, first, second, or third, it always means, it's quite obvious it means a day. Exodus 20. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath unto the Lord. For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Jehovah blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. What's he talking about here? Could this be 3,000 or 3 billion years? God said, I want you to rest on the Sabbath because I did it in six days. You'd have to have help to misunderstand that verse. You'd have to be taught that by somebody else. The clear teaching is six days. The old earth teaches, well, the position teaches the first three days were not literal days without the sun. Well, the problem with that is Exodus 20, 11 puts all seven days together and classifies them as the same. And the Bible starts off the first 13 verses with no sun, but they had light. If you read the end of the Bible, it ends up with no light. I mean, no sun, but they had light. The Bible ends and it says, Jesus is the light thereof. They have no need of the sun, for he is the light thereof. The old earth position says there's no closure evening and morning on the seventh day. So it could be billions of years. The problem with that is the Hebrew calls day seven. It's very literal and normal 24-hour day. Many scriptures refer to the seventh day, the seventh day. Hebrews 4, 4, Genesis 2, 2, Genesis 2, 3, the seventh day. It's real clear, okay? Um, God wasn't telling the Jews to work 6,000 years and take the rest of their life off either, by the way. He was telling them to work six days and rest one day and then get back to work, quite obviously. Some, some people say science has proven the earth is billions of years old. Folks, this argument is not between science and the Bible. The argument is between a current interpretation that scientists have and the Bible. Well, the scientist's interpretation change all the time. I taught science 15 years. You see, all kinds of things change, okay? I'm not against science. I love science. And the scientific position does not support the idea the earth is billions of years old. And I resent people saying, well, this is, you know, if you believe the Bible, you can't believe science. That's absolutely not true. The scientific evidence points to only a few thousand years. 
All evidence that of the earth is billions of years old is based on flawed logic. We cover that on our seminar part one. I'll bring that again in a minute. We got to stop. Okay, we got plenty more. See you in 10 minutes. And now Jamin will give his opening statement. Okay. Just lift it out. Okay. Well, I'd like to start out by just clarifying a little bit and, and put this issue into context historically and theologically. Um, recently, the Presbyterian Church of America issued a report and they, they kind of said, you know, next to all the other issues that we have in, in Christendom, this does not stack up. This is not the deity of Christ. It's not justification by faith. So just to start with a little bit of perspective on that. However, as I mentioned earlier, it is hugely important for other reasons. For me, it was personally a, a very important issue in coming to faith. But even more than that, in Romans 1, the Bible says that the created world is a clear and accurate witness of, the, of God's glory. And it renders man without excuse. That means that if anybody doesn't have the Bible, they first have creation to look at. And we can look at it and trust it and know that what we observe in the sky, in the gospel in the sky, is accurate. Christians are to magnify God in all that we do. And that includes how we approach observing the creation. In order to do that, we need to be disciplined and accurate in how we do it. And that's the proper business of Christians. Christians should be leading the way in scientific discovery. We covered a lot on what we agree on, but I do want to point out a couple of things that, that are important to this discussion. The first is that the Bible and creation are both true, accurate, and infallible. It's man's interpretation of both of these things that's, infall or that's fallible, right? It's not creation is less true than the Bible or vice versa. They are equally true because the same author created them both. I believe, and I think we both believe, that the Bible must be taken literally except when the context requires otherwise. We, we both believe that the Bible is in, the inerrant word of God in all disciplines of scholarship, uh, and that includes theology, that includes physics, that includes everything in between. And we, as Dr. Hovind mentioned, uh, the Bible does not conflict with any real facts of nature. Um, contrary to what you may have heard, this is not a settled issue um, over the history. It, this is, there's never been a consensus on age in this issue. Um, if you go back to the beginning with Augustine and Origen, uh, they believed in figurative view. Of course, there are plenty on the other side, and we could go on and on stacking up people on both sides for our arguments. That doesn't prove anything, but it, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this is not something that has recently come to the front. This is something that's been there since the beginning, and we have people on both sides, big leaders. In fact, we have some who are completely silent on this issue, who have taken very strong doctrinal stands in other areas. So you have people all the way across the board on this. Okay. It's not a test of orthodoxy. We have yet to see a church council that's come together and def define this issue as something that you're a heretic if you're in one camp, you're orthodox if you're in the other camp. So what does the Genesis count, account tell us? Um, before we get into that, I'll come back to that, but I want to start with what does it not tell us? First off, Genesis does not tell us anything about the actual length of time. And I know that's, that's contrary to what you may have heard, but there's nothing in the Genesis 1 account that gives us an actual length of time. Genesis 1 and 2 are complete in their scope, but they're not exhaustive in content. There's nothing in Genesis 1 or 2 that tells us anything about the law of gravity or the periodic table of elements. That doesn't make gravity unbiblical. It means that the Bible serves a different purpose than the natural creation. One tells about the big picture. And let's 
take a look. If any of you have been to uh, the Chicago, Chicago Museum of Art, you may have seen this picture. It's not coming out very well, but this is Monet's water lilies. It's huge. It fills a whole wall. The only way to really see what's happening in this picture is if you stand way back. It's a very big painting. So as you stand back, you can start to make out what the, the artist was doing there. And that's our view in Genesis of the creation account. We see all the important things. All the, the whole point of it is clear in Genesis. But God also tells us, and the Bible tells us, to come close and examine the brush strokes of the artist. So if we zoom in on it, you can start to see how he did it. You can't see the big picture anymore, but you bring them both together and you get the right understanding. So science would be that close-up view. How did God do it? What are the rules that he set up? These are the, the things that we're looking for in physics and astronomy and biology and geology and chemistry. How long did it take? What was his technique? No doubt it was incredibly complex when he flung out the galaxies by his word. There's no way that we could have recorded that in any textbook. There's no way that the Bible has every last detail about that. And it shouldn't. That's not the point. It's not a catalog of all that is true. It is simply telling us the true story very accurately and very specifically telling us the story that God meant to tell us. Now, I'm not going to go into all the different ways Genesis is used. It's used in, or the word day is used in Genesis 1. There's uh, multiple renderings of day, um, including less than 24-hour periods, more than 24-hour periods, I'll, I'll argue that in a minute, um, but I do want to look at Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, 4, in addition to the several types of day that you have in Genesis 1, it says in Genesis 2, 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So generations of time, generations. This is a week, a generation. And then, in the day. So, if you can't have it both ways. If we're going to be absolutely literal about this, then a day either means a day, 24-hour periods, or day has some other broader meaning, a figurative meaning. And in this case, we would have a conflict if we took the 24-hour day view because Genesis 2-4 says, in the day. So all six creation days are summed up in one day in this. There are other places in the Bible, and I, I do want to point out one thing about the use of an article uh, in conjunction or a number uh, in conjunction with the Hebrew word yom. Um, it's not the article, it's not a number that makes the word yom 24 hours or not. It's the context. Every passage has its own context. So there's not a, uh, there's not a simple rule about this. Uh, so let's look at Hosea 6, 1 and 2. God says, it's a, the prophet says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. And then it says, After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Nearly every commentary out there interprets this as a figurative period of time, but it's in conjunction with numbers. There are other difficulties. Um, Genesis, or day six is pretty full of activity. We got lots going on there. God creates thousands of species of land animals. God creates man. He observes all 15,000 uh, species of, of just the land animals, doesn't include all the other animals, and names them all. If he took two seconds per animal, per species, it would have taken him 10 hours of the day. Adam searches for a helpmate, helpmate but doesn't find any. God puts him to sleep, operates on him, heals him up, creates woman, brings him to Adam. Adam says, at last. Well, it's been 10 hours, so he's kind of impatient. But some guys have to wait a lot longer than that. But, <laughs> but there are other difficulties. I'm not going to go into all of them. So what do we observe in the heavens themselves? Here's a, I, these are some of my favorites. I'm just going to be shameless and show you what I like. But these are some of the biggest, most beautiful uh, galaxies that we can observe. They're deep space objects. This here is uh, where the stars are being born in this cloud. Now this picture is some of the most distant galaxies that we can see. 
They're about 12 billion light years away. A light year is the distance that light travels in a year, and therefore it tells us that we have about 12 billion light years to that object. Some have suggested that it's just the appearance of age, that God actually created the light in between those objects and us. But then we wouldn't actually need stars, would we? we just need that light in between. It would be a giant deception by God, and I don't think that's consistent with his nature. Okay, there's evidence on the earth, and we have a lot more to cover. All right. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. I'm switching up just a little bit. Dr. Hovind, if you would like to have your 10 minutes to rebut. Can I get five more minutes to get ready? <laughs> no, I'm good. All right. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think um, a couple of things need to be addressed here. I've got too many notes here. Um, I think it would be incorrect to characterize this debate by saying um, all modern scientists believe the Earth is billions of years old. That is simply not true. All scientists do not believe in the evolution or in billions of years. I got an or instead of on. I got it should be or. Um, even if they did, that's not how truth is established. Not by majority opinion. History has shown the majority is often wrong. They used to teach all the planets go around the Earth. That is wrong. They used to teach you know the big rocks fall faster than little rocks. That is wrong. They used to teach. Uh, all sorts of things in science, the phlogiston theory, the, uh, like you had a whole list of it one time, all the things that they taught were that they were simply wrong. So you don't go by majority opinion to determine right or wrong, or truth is not determined that way. It doesn't matter what all scientists believe. What matters is very clearly, what did Jesus say? And I trust what the Bible says over what any man says any day. Now, as far as the uh, argument that, uh, let me get my hyperlink working here, the argument that um, Scientists believe, most, all scientists believe the earth is billions of years old is simply not correct. Here's a list, a giant list of scientists throughout history who have believed in creation. Creation scientists, okay? Every branch of science was started by somebody who believed in creation. I've often challenged evolutionists to please name me one thing the, the theory of evolution has done for the advancement of science. It's useless. Even if it was true, it's a useless theory. And this age of the earth theory, the idea that the earth is billions of years old is also absolutely useless for the advancement of science. It has nothing to do with anything we've got from scientific advancements from this age of the earth theory. And I think it's a great hindrance to scientific research. Um, many scientists have been creationists. We could spend hours on this. And many scientists today are creationists. There's a book in six days, Why 50 Scientists Choose to Believe in Creation. There are several books like this available. Uh, there are thousands of scientists today who are creationists. So it is not correct to characterize this as science versus the Bible. This is a misunderstanding or a misapplication of science. Uh, let's see. Uh, right here. Oh. Yeah. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It's useless. It's a useless theory. Now, as far as the question of stars, how did the stars uh, get their light here? Uh, oh, let me go to... Stephen Hawking, who refused to debate me a few months ago when I was in England, said, uh, Stars are so far away that they appear to be just pinpoints of light. We cannot see their size or shape. How do we tell the distant types of stars apart? We can only see the color of their light, basically, is all we can tell. If you're going to measure the distance to a star... The only sure mathematical way is with parallax trigonometry, and you have to know two sides in one angle or two angles in one side. I taught trig for 15 years, okay? And you have to, you have to know some points, okay? The problem is the Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter. So if you're looking at a star from opposite sides of the Earth, the base of your triangle is way too small. What they've done to enlarge the base of the triangle is look at the star in January and then look at it in June. Now you have the opposite sides of Earth's orbit as the base of your triangle. Well, we all know it's 93 million miles to the sun, but that's only eight light minutes. The diameter of this huge circle we're going around is 16 light minutes. Well, the, a year has 525,000 minutes in it. So if that little yellow dot represented Earth's orbit, not the Earth, the orbit of the Earth, it's way too big, the drawing, for the, for the scale here. Actually, if you had two surveyors set up their transit 16 inches apart, representing the 16 light minutes of Earth's orbit, and they were looking at a dot 525,000 inches away, which is eight and a third miles, you would have a very skinny triangle. 16 inches between point A and B and point C is eight and a third miles away. That's the exact triangle you get when you try to measure one light year using Earth's orbit as the diameter. If you want to measure, that works out to be an angle of 0 0.017 degrees, by the way. If you want to measure 100 light years, you have to move your dot 830 miles away. 
Now, if I had two guys on my roof in Pensacola, Florida, looking at a dot in Chicago, trying to calculate the distance based on the angle between these two guys, parked 16 inches away from each other, I would say that's clearly impossible. And that's only 100 light years. To measure 15 billion is clearly impossible. So, some things to consider about starlight, which is often the, th the reason that people believe the universe is billions of years old. This textbook says you can't measure more than 100 light years. I don't think you can measure more than 20 light years, but I'll give them 100. Okay, I'll give them 500 if they quit crying. The fact is, you can't measure billions. All right. Now, we don't know the distance to the stars. They probably are billions of light years away. I wouldn't question that. But we don't know how far away they are. And you don't tell me. I, I hear Hugh Ross said, yeah, the farthest star is 14.76 billion light years away. I said, I just simply don't believe you. How did you measure that? Lufkin, Stanley, or Craftsman? And who held the other end of that tape measure? Hmm? <laughs> Secondly, nobody knows what light is. And we certainly don't know that it always travels the same speed throughout time or space. The whole theory behind a black hole is that light can be attracted by gravity. And we go through all kinds of things on my videotape number seven and on my website, Dr. Dino, showing the speed of light is not consistent. In 1999, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year, they brought it to a one mile an hour. The next year, they brought it to a dead stop. They slowed light down to zero. The, the experiment was repeated at Harvard, Smithsonian, and Cambridge. That's the way science works. Here's an article just last month. Physicists briefly freeze a pulse of light. They brought it down to zero. Meanwhile, at Princeton University, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. The speed of light has decreased over time. We have all kinds of measurements showing the speed of light has apparently decreased. There have been all kinds of experiments with, done with this. Uh, this guy said the speed of light was apparently exceeded by a factor of as much as 100. The speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero, this physicist, an evolutionist, by the way, says. The Big Bang Theory requires the speed of light to be much faster originally. This article, uh, August 2001, says the speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Uh, Imperial College of London, the professor said, the shocking possibility is the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. A Reuters News Service ran an article last year, said the speed of light may not be a constant. There uh, have been many articles on this. I have a whole collection. Here's a whole book about this faster than the speed of light. They ran an article in uh, um, April 2003, Discover Magazine. Was Einstein wrong about the speed of light? The answer to the article basically is yes. Einstein's theory was wrong. See, they start with the assumption the speed of light is consistent and never changes and can't be exceeded, and that's simply a false assumption to start with. Um, there's four articles from just recently in the last year or so about the speed of light is simply not a constant. From CNN, USA Today, New Scientist, and BBC News. You, all you got to do is search the folks. It's not correct to say the speed of light's always the same. Thirdly, the creation was finished and mature when God made it. The God that I worship, like Jesus, can make wine out of grapes that never existed, aged in time that never was. God can make light and stars simultaneously, okay? He didn't make two babies and put them in a garden and hand them a package of seeds and say, plant these quick. He, may, he can make a full-grown man, a full-grown woman, a full-grown tree with fruit already and on the tree, ripe, ready to eat. And he can make a full-grown universe with light already showing. See, I think the problem is many people are trying very hard to limit God. We can't go faster than the speed of light, so God, you can't either. And that, to me, is not, not wise. Fourth thing to consider, a light year is a distance, it's not a time. If the star is 15 billion light years away, and it probably is, nobody knows. That still wouldn't mean it took 15 billion years to get here. That's the stumbling block that guys like Hugh Ross have. They don't think, they, they, they're trying to limit God. God can't do anything faster than the speed of light. Well, how, how long does it take your prayers to get to heaven and back? Speed of light is not proven to be consistent. Why would star distance have anything to do with the age of the universe? Even if they are billions of light years away. Okay, how do they measure the speed of light? How do they measure the distance to the stars? This guy says, uh, we can find the absolute ages by comparing a star's color and brightness with those in stellar evolution models. What? We can tell how old it is by how old we think it is. That's what he's saying. Come on now. They talk about redshift and Cepheid variables. We can cover plenty on that it's based on the theory that the Doppler effect also affects light. We don't know that it does. But uh, the whole idea of measuring the distance to stars is simply not science. It, it's, it's beyond, you get beyond a few hundred light years, you're way beyond the branches of science that are testable, observable, and demonstrable. So the stars might be billions of light years away. I don't know. I'll give you a couple examples of recent changes here, though. Um, I'm going to run out of time. Here we go. Astronomers believed the veil, one of the best studied supernova remnants, was 2,500 light years away and 18,000 years old. They were quite wrong. In fact, the veil is only 1,500 light years away and 5,000 years old. 
I mean, just change it like that. Discover Magazine two years ago. Uh, the, most, the nearest Cepheids are difficult to determine their absolute distance with any, any great accuracy, they admitted here in uh, Cambridge University Press. Uh, all large distances in astronomical literature are subject to an error of perhaps 10% from this cause alone. You simply can't measure it. We know that faintness, how bright the star is, arises from two causes, distance and absorbing matter in space, and it's not possible generally to apportion it between the two. Here's what happens. The astronomers will look at a star and say, wow, that one's bright, it must be closer. That one's dim, it must be farther. Well, it could be there's dust in between. It could be absorbing matter in space. We simply don't know. If you try to question, though, the red shift, you can see what happened to uh, uh, Halton Hart when he tried to question the red shift and how he lost his government grants and his job and everything else. <laughs> Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, if you want more on that. S Eleven times in Scripture, the Bible says God stretched out the heavens. He stretched out the heavens. He stretched them out, Isaiah 45. He stretched out the heavens, Jeremiah chapter 10. So the stretching of the heavens is one possible explanation for the red shift. It does not, we don't know the distance. God could have created it all yesterday and flung the stars out there in space and had the light star way out there and the trail of light in between. No problem. The God that I worship, the God that I worship is not limited by things like that. Thank you so much. It's your turn, Jamin. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> well, a couple of things. Um, I would like to clarify how we, how scientists, how anybody measures uh, the distance to stars. Um, first of all, nobody, nobody bases it on brightness ever. Brightness is is an arbitrary measure, um, and you correctly pointed out that um, there are many different brightnesses of stars, so that wouldn't make sense to measure it that way. Um, in fact, the two main methods for doing this are stellar parallax and redshift, uh, and Again, you correctly pointed out that stellar parallax doesn't work over great distances. And what we mean by great distances is many thousands or millions of light years. It may seem hard to imagine, but we actually can measure these distances through parallax with great precision, even though the sides are very long. That's not, that's not beyond our capability. There was a time when uh, people thought that you could never see things smaller than a cell. Um, but we know that's not true. And with new technology, new discoveries, comes new uh, data. And so actually that's, and I would also clarify that stellar parallax doesn't uh, require you to know just the, the sides. What you have in that triangle are all three angles. We actually know all three angles because we would measure it when we're at a right angle, which is 90 degrees, and then you say you measure it again and then that'd be 30 degrees and then uh, then we know that the final one is 60 degrees. We know all three angles and we know at least two, well we know one side and it's not hard to figure it out from there. Um, speed of light is slowing down. I'll, I guess the best response I can give on that is that this was up for debate um, a couple of years ago and in the last few years um, it's been soundly re refuted and it's been uh, rejected as a field of study. People are not actually out there um, arguing that the speed of light has slowed over time. Now, everybody has seen what happens when light goes through a window or a prism. You can slow light down through certain means, but light as, as a speed has not decreased over time. So it's like saying um, you can slow your car down as opposed to the speed limit has changed. The speed limit of light has never changed. It is absolutely reliable in that regard. Um, I want to also address, well, incidentally, this argument has been uh, listed by other creationist groups as um, one that creationists should not use. It's become an embarrassment to uh, the international, or the uh, ICR uh, group. And so this is not something that we as Christians want to hold on to. This is a uh, completely refuted theory, and uh, it doesn't support other data that we have. Um, I also want to address a little bit about the usefulness of the, of the distance measurements. Um, Dr. Hoven mentioned that um, evolution, you know, has never 
been shown to be useful, um, or neither has an old Earth or an old universe. And uh, I don't believe in evolution, but um, I don't think we should measure theories based on their usefulness, but on their truth. So what does the data tell us? And science, data, is not infallible, but we try to pull together all that we have and all that we know and see what it's telling us. And I don't believe that we ever want to hold up individual little pieces of data that con conflict with the general body of data and say, you know, this proves all the rest wrong. We try, it's the same in uh, good theology. We don't ever want to look for proof texts just to prove a point in the face of the rest of Scripture. Um, let's see, oh, mature Adam. I think we should distinguish between a mature Adam and an old Adam, just like we distinguish between mature earth and an old earth. So if we look at Adam in the garden, he was most certainly, the Bible tells us he was created fully grown. That is a mature Adam. But he certainly wasn't old. For all intents and purposes, he was like a newborn baby. He had no calluses. He, didn't ha he wasn't balding. He didn't have liver spots or cavities in his teeth. So he didn't have the appearance of age. And I think that would be inconsistent. Again, if God created the light in between stars and here, there is no reason to have stars at all. All you have is the picture coming through space. So there's no reason to have stars at all. If he created the light, why create stars? Essentially, that's all we can see. There's no other way to detect stars or galaxies than by the light they send. It's impossible. So think about that. How, how, why would God create a, an illusion, essentially, for us to look at if it wasn't true? I don't think that's consistent with him, and I don't think it's consistent with the Genesis account. Um, and I, I would also just kind of say that um, my brother Hovind mentioned that you know, we shouldn't limit God, and I agree. I, I think uh, a small, very young universe in Earth does kind of limit God. It, it says, there, you know, this is, we can fit it all inside of our brains. Uh, it's very simple, but in my view, what we're seeing out there is something that's huge and beautiful and vast and mind-boggling, and that is much more consistent with the God of the Bible, the God who is infinite in wisdom, infinite in understanding, all-powerful. And the universe is just a reflection of that. I, I see a universe that is just declaring loudly, our God is huge. He's beyond reason, beyond comprehension, you can only approach him a little bit by looking up there, but it should break your mind to try to get it all in. That's what I see when we look up there. It's a beautiful, huge universe, and it accurately tells us about the glory of the Creator. Okay. Um, a couple other. Um, there is the implication... Um, that we've heard many times is that astronomers can determine redshift or determine distances to the universe, uh, within the universe by only one method, uh, which is redshift. There's parallax, which is another method. Um, there's also uh, pulsar um, frequency. You can tell some, combined with other data, you can tell how far away it is. Um, there's many different methods. There's also Let's see here. We got so many things to cover. <clears throat> um, I've I've heard several arguments that light might take a shortcut through through space. Um, the problem with that is it flies in the face of of general relativity. Um, Einstein was very successful in describing the way that space is constructed. Um, it seems hard to imagine, but we can actually measure the curvature of space, uh, which is really um, an amazing accomplishment, and what we've seen is that the curvature of space outside of uh, individual large bodies is very flat, and what that means is the distance is pretty easily measured because um, if the light is going through flat space, then it's going to take exactly as long as there are light years. So um, large distances based on 
and flat space are consistent with other measurements that we have. So if we look, if we take a distance from stellar parallax on the one hand, and then we measure it via redshift on the other, on this side, then we actually find that they agree very closely. All right. Earlier, um, Dr. Hoven mentioned that Hugh Ross's uh, statement about the universal flood uh, was a deceptive answer, and, and I will uh, defend my brother on that side and just say um, that that is out of context. That's not what he meant. Um, what universal, in uh, according to Hugh Ross, which I find to be a very compelling theory, is that universal takes into, into account the frame of reference that the people and, and Noah and God were working in in that, in that passage. So uh, the theory would be that Adam, I'm sorry, Noah, would have been in an ark and floating on a, a giant flood that he couldn't have possibly seen any other land. He couldn't have seen, for all intents and purposes, it was universal. Okay, and that doesn't necessarily imply global. And I, I will clarify that I haven't fully reconciled this issue for myself. Um, I think there has not been a, a satisfactory interpretation of the scientific evidence and uh, an accurate rendering of Scripture that's all come together in one, in one argument. Uh, so I think there's still an opportunity for cr Christian creationists who are also scientists to do a better job of interpreting the evidence. So... Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to a different phase. Uh, this will be where the <coughs> presenters question each other. The person who gets to ask the first question, then their, their opponent gets to give an answer. They give three minutes for the answer, and then the asker of the question gets two minutes to rebut the answer, if that makes any sense. so. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start again with Dr. Hoven. You get to ask the question. Jamin gets three minutes to answer the question. You get two minutes to rebut his answer. Does that okay. make sense? Uh, Jamin, I would like two parts to this question. Do you believe the Bible teaches there was death before sin? And do you believe your frame of reference, your worldview, your old earth theory teaches there was death before sin? So was there death before sin, or why is there death in the world? Might be another way to phrase the question. Mm -hmm. According to your worldview and according to Scripture, how, do you think they're both the same? Go ahead. Well, thanks. Um, I found this question to be very thought-provoking, and, and uh, as I was, and of course, it's one of the big questions that Christians are asked all the time. So we need to to have a good answer on this one, um, and also there's many layers. So. Um, I, I would not equate death with evil, first of all. There are two different questions. Why is there death or why is there evil? And, and the reason I say that is because uh, we know that Christ was ordained to die before the foundation of the world. God set that up. And that was a profoundly good thing. So I would not say that death inherently is bad. In that case, it was a very good thing. There are other examples. However, death and suffering... Um, did come into the world by sin, and I, I, but I would specify that human death, uh, there's two different kinds. There's spiritual death, which was a natural consequence of the fall, and then there was physical death, which was the judgment when God took away the, the tree of life, right? So spiritual death, in Romans 5, it says spiritual, that death came through sin, and spiritual life came through Christ, so it's spiritual death we're talking about. Animals, on the other hand, um, I don't think this applies to. Um, I don't think God made any mistakes in his design. I think that he, or he created carnivores to eat, eat meat, and he created herbivores to eat um, plants. So I think that's part of his very good creation, and I think that creatures that don't have a spirit uh, are not created in the image of God. It's not inherently evil for them to die. I think that's part of God's natural order that he created, um, as opposed to human death. He didn't mean for humans to physically die. That's why I gave him the tree of life. So. Well, okay. 
Yeah, I get two minutes. Let me just take one and let him take the other one for an answer. Do you believe then when God said in Genesis 1.31, at the end of chapter 1, God looked at everything and said it was very good. When he said that, at that time, Adam was created, and at that time was Adam standing on top of thousands of feet of, of dead things, fossils, and was Adam seeing the animals, you know, tear the guts out of each other uh, in, around him, like the lion tearing up the zebra. And God looked at that and said it was very good. You're telling me God said that was very good. Again, yes, I think that his creation was exactly the way he intended it to be. I don't think there was any mistakes in it. I think that the design of uh, carnivores was exactly exactly what it should have been. Uh, lions would have a hard time digesting grass, and uh, you know, sharks would have a hard time eating seaweed. Their bodies aren't made for it. So I do think that that was the way God intended it, and because they were not created in God's image, I don't see that it's inherently evil that they should have uh, died. I, as to the garden, I don't know how the garden was set up other than it was paradise. So I do believe that the, Bible, that the garden right now, is the way I believe is the garden uh, did not have death in it. God uh, segregated it. Well, if I can continue. Did, when God, the Bible says God's going to restore it like it used to be someday, are we going to always see the death and suffering of animals then? Is that going to be the restored to the, be the very good again? It'll just be human death? My point is, I think you have an inconsistency in your theology that okay. I think you need to look at. Okay, can, so you think, okay, so the question I'm, is, when well, things are restored, yep. I'm, I'm going to ask that, uh, you've had your three minutes, I'm going to ask that, sure. that you address his answer for two minutes. He, he's got to give a question now, right? What's that? Then, then he'll get to ask you a question, or you can ask another question. Uh, another question? Uh, no, I'd, I'd like to have you address his answer. For two oh, yeah, I think his answer theologically is is totally wrong. I think that the Bible teaches clearly there was no death, a man or animal. I think uh, you'd have a hard time proving from Scripture that plants uh, die. If you can get my screen on there, brother, I've got quite a few. Uh, I think I can demonstrate pretty clearly from uh, nuts. Get the wrong. Okay, um, let's see. I got to the wrong one. Was there death before sin? Never mind. You shut it down. I don't have the right slide up. Um, I go through seminar part six that uh, I think plants wither, they fade, but it's, it's pretty clear that uh, there's a distinction between plants and, and animals and humans. The Bible clearly talks about humans and animals being alive. It never talks about plants being alive. Uh, they fade, they wither, uh, but they, they don't die. My computer can die, but it's not alive. Um, a car can die, but it's not alive. So I think that uh, there's quite a, an inconsistency in theology to say that there was a uh, there was death in the world, and it wasn't brought here by man. The Bible says in Romans chapter eight, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth. It's pretty clear all through Scripture that the whole creation suffers because of man's sin. All the animals drowned because of man's sin. Uh, there's always been suffering in the world because of man's sin. As far as the teeth, uh, the there's a lion that just died oh, 40 years ago, but it was used in movies for years. Uh, the lion never ate meat in its life. His name was Little Tyke. I've got a picture of it here, uh, if I can get to it in time. But uh, Little Tyke died in a movie, in a movie set accident. Actually, went, lived 11 years without ever uh, eating meat. They actually refused. There, uh, one lady said they have a kennel full of dogs that they raise that they never eat meat. They're vegetarian dogs. So it's not correct to say that the teeth proves an animal was uh, necessarily... Um, I think I got the picture of Little Tyke right here someplace. There we go. The lion that wouldn't eat meat named Little Tyke. Creation Magazine, March 2000, has a big six-page article about it. Um, so it's inconsistent to say that uh, the animals, have, because of their sharp teeth, have to eat meat. Panda bears have sharp teeth. Uh, fruit bats have really sharp teeth. They never eat meat in their life. Okay, so I think that's, that's incorrect. All right, we have uh, time for one question from Jamin to Dr. Hoven, and then the answer and rebuttal, and then we'll be taking a break. Sure. <clears throat> Dr. Hoven, um, on your website, you respond to the Answers in Genesis uh, group that, that put out the uh, arguments that creationists should not use. Um, and one of them, there, there's several that, in which your response was similar to this. So the issue is not the, the actual argument that they're refuting. But um, what they, so the argument is there was no rain before the flood. This is not a direct teaching of Scripture, so there should be no dogmatism. And your response was, there is no way to know the truth of this one. And then you go on to explain that but this, because the Scripture is silent on this issue. So my question is, 
On matters that the scriptures are silent on, is there no way to know about them? Okay, no, there, there may be ways to know. I love science. That's what scientific, uh, scientific uh, explorations are for and scientific observations. But uh, this, as far as was there rain before the flood, I think my point was the Bible mentions during the creation week, a mist went forth and watered the garden. It's never mentioned again until all of a sudden it rains in the days of Noah. The assumption is that it never rained until the flood, but I, I think it'd be impossible to prove that from Scripture is my point. So I think that we could look at scientific evidence uh, and discover many things that the Bible is silent about. The Bible never mentions computers, never mentions cars, doesn't mention a lot of things. That doesn't mean, you know, they don't exist. Um, so, but I think there are things the Bible is so clear on, like the age of the earth. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. Uh, Adam brought death into the world. I think the Bible is so clear on these topics that it's not a matter of the Bible's silent and we have to guess what we believe. The Bible is clear and we have to decide what we believe. That's my point. And then my response would be, um, can you show me, or is there a place where it actually says that um, the creation days are 24-hour periods? Um, and, and also, you know, does it refer, so I don't see gravity in there. I don't see um, DNA. There's, you know, as you mentioned, computers. Uh, you know, where do you see the Okay, Exodus the chapter 20 in the Ten Commandments. God wrote it on a rock with his finger. He doesn't stutter. He said, In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And he rested the seventh day. And he's telling Moses, I want you to honor the seventh day because I did it in six days. Later in Exodus chapter 31, verse 17, God said, It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. If, that, if the earth is billions of years old, it, God lied when he said he rested on the seventh day because it wasn't the seventh day. It was the X number of bazillionth day, you know. So I think it's accusing God of, of either not being able to tell time or simply lying to say mm -hmm. that the earth is billions of years old. And I don't think it's heresy to think the earth is old. I think it's heresy to teach there was death before sin. Down that one, I'll stand my ground. Okay. All right, uh, we're taking a break now. And so if you have questions, if you've written them on a 3 by 5 card, if you can hand them to one of the people at the exits, and then they'll make sure that I get them. And, and part of the second half will be uh, allowing questions from the audience. When I say allowing questions, we'll, we'll review the cards. So thanks. We're going to take a 10-minute uh, break. Uh, Dr. Holman, it's your turn to ask Jamin a question. Uh, yes, sir. Um, is the God of the Bible capable of creating in six days? Could it have been six days, 6,000 years ago? And could it be that he did leave us an accurate record in the Bible of how he did it so that the average person can read this record and not need to have a physics PhD explain it to them? In other words, the average person reading the Bible, in my opinion, is not going to come up with, six, not going to come up with billions of years, okay? So do we have to have a guru tell us what this book says, i.e. a cult leader, or can the average person read it? So my question is kind of complex, but could, he, could God have done it in six days, 6,000 years ago, and left us an accurate record, and the average person can read it and understand it? Or why is 99% of the Christians wrong about this, I guess? I'm trying to figure out. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I, would, I guess I don't agree that 99% of Christians agree on this, but even if they did, uh, that wouldn't be good enough for me because um, our measure is what is true and what is... Um, what's called for in the scriptures. So um, the question is, if the average person can kind of understand what, what it means, um, what's buried in that, in my view, is, that, is the assumption that the simplest interpretation is always right. And we could say that, yes, if we um, gave the Bible to somebody who had never seen it before, had no education, um, they could read it and find that it must be the familiar days that I'm familiar with, the 24-hour days. Well, that's true. Um, they would probably do that, and they would also interpret many other passages of the Bible wrong, most likely. That's why we have discipleship, we have missions, we have churches. That's why we have theologians. We need help. We don't just take the, the most plain meaning. Some, some things are more complex than others. So we do our best with the evidence that we have. Sometimes it is very easy to interpret. Sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes um, we get the wrong idea, such as in Revelation 1-7, uh, where 
it says um, that um, he will, well, let's go to it here. Then I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth and the four, they called the four winds. Um, you could take that literally. In fact, Calvin and Luther did. They held that to be, to literally mean that the earth is flat. Okay? So, yeah, we could always take the most familiar interpretation or the easiest to access. And sometimes we'd be right, sometimes we'd be wrong. Um, but it was scientific observation, better science, not better exegesis, that helped Christians in the church to change their view on the flat earth. And same thing with uh, geocentrism, where you had uh, scriptures that pointed to the rising of the sun and you know, the sun going around the earth. It was a figurat figurative language. We don't take that literally anymore, but there was a time that we did, that many Christians did, and they were wrong about it. I don't think there's anybody here who believes that the earth is flat and goes around, or that the sun goes around the earth. So um, we need the help of scientists and Christ Christians and pastors and in all these disciplines, we need to do the best that we can to find out what's happening there. So that's my very long answer. Okay, as a follow-up to that then, um, that, that sort of is a red herring, which is an argument used to draw attention away from the, the question that's asked. The fact that other passages of Scripture are obviously figurative does not really mean anything as far as the Genesis passage. Can, is the Genesis passage then, my question I guess was, is God capable of doing it in six days? Could it be only 6,000 years old? And could it be the Genesis account is not figurative, but actually six days? Yeah. Yes. It could be. Yes, it, it absolutely could be. God could have done it in an instant. Okay. Or he could have done it in 100 billion years. He could have made Adam's skin blue. But the, the account doesn't mention that. It doesn't get into those specifics. We, we don't have any reason to believe that it was that Adam was blue, right? I mean, there's a lot of other things that it doesn't tell us. So, um, yes, it's possible. God could have done many things, but there's not evidence or the evidence doesn't support, in my view, that he did it in six 24-hour days. So what I shared earlier about the trees being made before the sun and the insects being made after the sun and about Adam being 130 when Seth was born and no death till Adam sinned, uh, you keep saying there's no evidence from Scripture. I think I gave a lot of evidence from Scripture that points to 6,000 years ago. That's what the dates add up to. That's what Christians through history have taught by the thousands. I think probably many people in this room would say they see it as very, it's obvious it was six days, 6,000 years ago. But So they're all wrong? Um, I'm not going to say for sure if they are or aren't. I interpret it differently. Um, so, again, it's man's interpretation of science, man's interpretation of the Scriptures that is fallible. So, yes, there's evidence. How, what does the evidence tell us? And in my view... Um, the evidence is consistent with science in Genesis that it was very old and that there was time for the whole thing. So, yep, sorry. All right, we're going to move on and have uh, Jamin ask a question of Dr. Hoven. Well, okay, we uh, kind of covered some of these, but I, I would like to hear you talk about this a little bit more. Um, my understanding of the of the young earth idea of literal, what the word literal means, is that literal is that which would be most obvious or most familiar to the average person, maybe a young child or an uneducated believer or somebody in uh, the mission field, for instance. Um, therefore, a literal rendering of day would be the kind of day that is most familiar to that kind of person. So uh, my question goes back to Revelation 7, 1. Um, I have two, two of them. After this, I saw, the, saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds. And Psalm 91, 4 says, He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. So using these passages and reading them literally, how would you describe the shape of the earth, and how would you describe God? 
Well, as far as the shape of the Earth, I think uh, we still talk about the, the compass having four points, north, south, east, west, and it appears that there are four bulges to the Earth. There was an article in National Geographic a few months ago, a few, about a year ago maybe, about the Earth does have four spots that are higher than other spots. They don't know why. Like it's near Hawaii, the water's quite a bit higher. I don't know about the corner of the Earth, but I think it, it's very common in every language to speak with, uh, uh, to be... Um, use metaphors and similes when I say I'm hungry as a horse or he's grouchy as a bear or something like that. I think it's quite obvious in the context that it's, it's not to be taken literally. I just don't see anything in the Genesis context that makes us not want to take it literally. Why would God start off with an allegory? Then how do we trust any of the book? You know. And plus, Jesus referred back to Genesis 25 times and never once even implied that it wasn't literally true as written six days. When he said the creation of Adam was the beginning, he didn't say just the beginning of mankind. He said that was the beginning. Uh, I don't see any problem here. Um, to me, it's it's quite obvious to the average reader that it's it's six yeah. days. Yeah. So so to that point, um, you mentioned the average reader, and again, I think of. Uh, the average reader in Nepal or the average reader um, in kindergarten or the average, re you know, there's, I would guess that it wouldn't be completely unheard of if you went to some of our missionary locations, uh, you gave them these scriptures and said, what does it mean? We don't need to talk about it anymore. I bet you there would be at least a couple of them that would say, well, maybe God's a bird. You know, they don't know any different. It says, uh, he will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. Well, without help of the rest of theology, the rest of the evidence that we have, uh, might not they say that, or might not they read Revelation 7-1 and say, okay. yeah. well, I, I, it must mean that the earth is flat. It looks flat to me. Well, here's, the, here's the, what you're doing. The problem you have here is if you read all through Scripture, you read the whole Bible, all 66 books, numerous times it talks about, you know, God gathers, he's, Jesus said, I would have gathered you as a hen gathereth her brood. There are many allegories, and it's quite obvious from the, God talks about the uh, different parts of God, the hand of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord, and yet we see God as a spirit, you know, has, but that's obvious to anybody reading the whole Scripture that, that these become uh, figurative. But reading the whole Scripture does not tell us the Genesis account is figurative. Reading the whole Scripture tells us the Genesis account is literal. There is no place in Scripture where... Uh, that's why I think it's a red herring where you're trying to draw attention away from the Genesis account. It's true there are allegories in Scripture, but that doesn't mean the Genesis account is allegorical. That's a point I think you're missing. Yeah. I, again, the, the point is simply that the door is open to interpret it other than exactly literal if there's good reason to do that. I think that's... The point. If there's good reason. I don't see any good reason to do that anywhere in Genesis. And I think anybody reading the whole Bible would not come away saying God is a bird. They would say, obviously, this is just like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings for protection. God keeps us for protection. All right. Um, let's see. Jamin asked the question, do you feel answered, Jamin? Did you, yeah. did you rebut back? I mean, we had quite a bit going on. Yeah, I, I think... I'm right. satisfied. Let's move on to another question. Okay. And Dr. Holman, it's your turn to ask Jamin a question. Okay, if you can get my slides on there, brother. Um, it's pretty obvious from reading Genesis uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7 that God told Noah to build a really, really large boat, uh, somewhere between 450 and 550 feet long, depending on what a cubit is. Uh, this would take a long time. Uh, the, the Hebrew tradition is it took him seven years to build the boat. No, I don't think there's any way to tell for sure from Scripture, but it certainly would take a long time to build a boat, you know, four or five hundred feet long. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 7, the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. The next verse says, or, uh, two verses later, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Why would anyone reading this passage come to the conclusion that you have come to that it was just covering the mountains that he could see. I mean, if the water is over the mountains, it's no longer a local flood. Uh, and it says all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. For you to come and say this is only talking about Noah's perspective as far as he could see, I think you're adding to the Word of God. To me, the Bible doesn't need any help to be interpreted. This is all the high hills were covered. And I think the reason for the local flood teaching that you hold to is because 
you've, you've absorbed and believed the idea that the geologic column is somehow accurate, and you know for sure that a worldwide flood would eliminate the column, wipe out the column. So why would you hold to the position this is a, a local flood? Is it because you want to preserve the geologic record? Uh, no, but there are a lot of other issues surrounding <clears throat> a global flood that uh, don't seem to make sense to me. But to your, to your question, um, the, uh, the language seems to indicate, I'm sorry, Yep, the language seems to indicate that uh, it was global and universal in your opinion, correct? And oh, yeah. So um, I, I'd like to just use some other scripture to kind of clarify my position. If you go to Romans 1.8, it says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Okay, so if, that, if that's literally true, then we have no use for missions because all the world has heard the gospel. And uh, in Colossians 1, we give thanks to God since we heard of your faith and for the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. No scholars, no Hebrew scholars um, that I've ever read have ever interpreted these to actually literally mean that the apostles had gone to uh, North America and had preached the gospel to the Indians and had gone to the Far East and had uh, preached the gospel there. <clears throat> so there are times when the author is trying to convey a um, specific frame of reference for that audience. And um, again, I haven't, I will admit that um, there isn't a fully satisfactory uh, position in my view on this. Uh, I'm arguing the local view from Genesis because that makes a little bit more sense for me right now, but I haven't eliminated all the questions. So there are a lot of open issues on this, but I think it is possible that God was specifically focused on the uh, people in that story and that and on that region. So just as in just as Paul is referring to the Roman Empire to in the book of Romans and in Colossians, um, because that was the extent of their reach and influence. That was what mattered in that letter. Um, I also think that that is the type of thing that's happening in Genesis for the flood. Okay, I would argue that I think the gospel did go to all the world. I think there's overwhelming evidence that numerous people came across the oceans well, well before Columbus. Roman swords were found in Tucson, Arizona. Roman artifacts were found in Tucson, Arizona back in the 1930s. I held them in my hand when I was there. So I think they did go throughout all the world. Secondly, the Bible, back, let me slides back on if you would. It's not just the book of Genesis that talks about all the mountains being covered. Psalm 104 has another reference to it. This is from a psalmist who said, God, talking about God, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it. The antecedent is the earth. He covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. If the earth is covered like a garment and the water stood above the mountain, I am convinced from studying certainly Hugh Ross's position, and I think you've followed that, is the reason for believing a local flood is only, not because the scriptures teach that, but it's because they know full well if, if the earth is billions of years old, they think the geologic column is a record of that, and this flood would have wiped it out. So they're only holding to this, I think, ludicrous doctrine that he built this big boat and stayed in there for a year for a local flood because they don't want to upset the geologic teaching. That's my thinking. Okay. Um, actually, I'm not even going to argue for the geologic column. I think that uh, there's good reason to, but I'm not going to because I'm not a geologist. Um, I think there's good, good evidence there. Um, yeah, but you, I'm the, sorry, I didn't hear that. Did you say there's good evidence to believe in the geologic column? Yeah, yeah okay. I, I believe there is. Um, but I also would just go by uh, logic. Um, we currently have about 30 million species living on the earth. Uh, we, according to the account in Genesis of the flood, Noah had to take two of every kind and seven of many other kinds. So 30 million times two and seven, um, that's a tight, tight ship. And, uh, but, but the local view, if you combine it with Romans, or Genesis 7, actually specifies which animals need to come on the ark. And, and so that narrows it down to just a few hundred. Um, so I guess that's a pretty strong argument to me that, that the frame of reference there is local. It's what God is trying to, it's to convey the story of that area for, uh, for Noah. Yep. Okay. Um, 
I hate to interrupt the flow of thought, but I believe that we're on, Jamin, on your last question, your third question for Dr. Hogan. Okay. Um, Dr. Hovind, my, my question is, uh, we've covered it a little bit, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. Um, there was a time at which, in which the church, the official teaching of the church was flat earth, was geocentrism, that we had uh, major leaders in the church who were right on many theological issues, Calvin and Luther, for instance, um, but they believed that the earth was flat based on texts such as we've already covered in um, so I guess my question is, how did the church come to change its view about the shape of the earth and um, earth's orbit around the sun? Okay, I would disagree strongly that the, I don't think there was ever a time that the church taught the earth was flat. That's been researched thoroughly, and it's just simply not true. The Bible teaches very clearly in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, that the Lord sits upon the circle of the earth. I think Christians that read their Bible have always known it was round. I don't care what Luther or anybody else taught. I care what does the Bible teach. There may have been a few people who taught that. They were simply wrong because the Bible clearly teaches the earth is round. As far as the geocentric theory, I am a heliocentric uh, centrist, okay? I taught her science for years. I am pretty firmly convinced the sun is in the center, not the earth. But uh, there, is a, there are a surprising number of people today, scientists today, who are still geocentrists. Uh, I disagree with them. I, I, we can talk about all the Foucault pendulum and all the arguments for heliocentrism if you'd like. But um, I think that the earth is the center of God's attention and may actually be the center of the universe, even though it's not the center of our solar system. There'd be two different things. As far as we know, we look in all directions and see stars equally spaced uh, in all directions. So the earth may indeed be the center of the universe, not the center of the solar system. That's the difference. Okay. Um, so, in your view, then, it's not that science really had nothing to do with, with uh, changing people's views on, on the shape of the earth and the uh, relative oh, yeah, orbit yeah. around? I would say people have taught things that are wrong throughout history, uh, which is why I'm here tonight to straighten this out. Um, that, um, but that, doesn't, that, has, that is not a reflection on the Bible. Um, it's it's in our interpretation of the, Just because some people teach things doesn't mean the Bible teaches things, and that's the confusion. So there may be some people who have taught different things throughout history, you know, that are, that are simply wrong. The Scriptures is what we have to stay, take as our, our rule of faith and practice, not the, uh, not the current teaching going around. And you mentioned, I guess I don't know if it's rebuttal time, but 30 million species, that's come up several times tonight, and I strongly disagree. The Bible told him to take the different kinds. There are about 8,000 basic kinds of animals in the world. Uh, God, was God told Noah to take those in whose nostrils was the breath of life and those on dry land. And the number 30 million includes fish and includes insects, which didn't have to go on the ark. About 8,000 kinds of animals is all that's necessary. Noah, Adam could have named them in two hours uh, to say 8,000 words you, at, at, at 100 words a minute. Now, I speak 300 words a minute when I get going fast. You know, At 60 words a minute, you can name 8,000 animals in two and a quarter hours. So Adam didn't have to wait all day to find Eve. A uh, couple hours. Wow, okay. he's very patient. <laughs> um, okay. All right. <laughs> I've been looking through the questions, so I'm, 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 I think we're supposed to be in the rebuttal phase, although I've heard you talking a lot, Dr. Hovind. So do you feel like you've accurately, let's see, rebuttal is actually, excuse me, Jamin, it's your turn to rebut Dr. Hovens, but I guess the question is, is do we feel like we've covered this issue? Or do you want to rebut what he said? Which issue? Yeah, wait. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a leap then and we're gonna talk we're gonna take some of the questions from the audience and um, and what's gonna happen here is I'll ask the question and you'll both get about two and a half minutes to respond, all right? And so mm -hmm. the first question, uh, Dr. Hoven will get to go first, and the second question, Jamin, you'll get to go first. Um, and I, the, uh, we have quite a few questions on dating, scientific dating, and where that fits into this whole argument. And instead of asking an exact question, I figure that just talking about dating and where it fix, fits into the young earth, old earth debate would probably be enough lead for the both of you. I don't date, I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> Dr.
Dr. Hoven, would you like to start talking about scientific, <laughs> the scientific dating method as scientific. it relates to the age of the earth? Scientific dating, like using the internet or something. Uh, no. <laughs> Go ahead and get my slides. You're determined, both okay. of you, to be funny, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, I cover carbon dating particularly and uh, se several of the common uh, dating methods on my video 7. I won't have time for that in two and a half minutes. But back in 1949, when carbon dating was first invented by Willard Libby, you have to understand way before that, in 1830, the geologic column was invented. And dating was really done by the geologic position, which the geologic column doesn't exist anyplace. But that's another long story. Carbon dating didn't work in 1949. The lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old. The skin dated 21,000 years old. In 1963, it still wasn't working. A living mollusk shell dated 2,300 years old. It is still alive, okay? In 1970, they said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it doesn't entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. They pick the dates they want. 1971, a freshly killed seal was carbon dated at 1,300 years old. 1975, one part of a mammoth is 40,000 years old, another part's 26,000. This is coming from the same animal. Um, in 1981, they said, no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of giving accurate and re reliable results. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven and relative. The accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. Living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. We can go all through history. I mean, it just, it gets worse, okay? 1992, they got two mammoths, 22,000 and 16,000. The mammoths were buried side by side. In 1996, uh, they got carbon dates from the same uh, sample, ranging from 53,000 to 27,000. That's a 96% error. This is not science. Carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium strating, doesn't matter. They're all based on obvious assumptions, which the evolutionist doesn't like to admit normally. Uh, they said in uh, the last two years we got an absolute date for the Gandong beds. It has the interesting value of 300,000 years, and plus or minus 300,000 years. <laughs> well, that's an absolute date, all right. Uh, they dated lava from Mount St. Helens, just erupted, uh, which uses, uses a different method, uses potassium argon dating. And dating, uh, we could spend two days on this, but dating lava from Mount St. Helens, fresh out of the, out of the uh, volcano, gave ages of ranging from 350,000 to 2.8 million. It should have been zero. Okay, it doesn't work. One experiment's worth a pound of theory any day, and I can tell you from the experimental perspective, it doesn't work. Okay, and because of the assumptions it's based on. Thank you, sir. Well, um, there are a couple of interesting points brought up there. Uh, one is, I, first I'm going to address carbon-14 dating. Um, let me just be clear here. Carbon-14 dating has very little to do with dating the age of the Earth. Its half-life is too short. It's a few thousand years. Uh, it's about 5,700 years. It's far too short to give any kind of meaningful date for uh, geolo geologic purposes. Um, so carbon-14 dating, that's why they don't use it for, car for rock dating or for fossil dating in general. Uh, occasionally they do, but most of the time they use it for organic rotting material. That's why uh, we were seeing pictures of uh, buried mammoths and things like that uh, that were buried in the ice. It's, it's more useful for that, but it is inherently less accurate than the roughly 40 other methods that are out there. There's many, many radiometric dating methods. I'm not, um, I'm not a geologist, um, but I do know, the little bit that I do know is that carbon-14 dating is, is way over-referenced. It's, really, um, it's not really relevant to dating the Earth. Um, but the methods that are are much more re um, reliable, uh, and they're based on very sound science, which is um, the, one of the four fundamental forces of nature, the weak nuclear force. Uh, that governs how atoms decay, and it's very easily demonstrable in a, in a lab. It's uh, been proven uh, repeatedly, and yes, there are some things that uh, can throw these measurements off, but they're pretty well understood at this point. So I don't want to I don't want to get too technical, and I somebody graciously uh, pointed that out. So the point of radiometric dating is to be able to take an element and by measuring how much of its um, parent material, uh, for instance, a radio, radioactive material has decayed. 
and we know how long the half-lives are for the different um, materials. So uh, of the 40-some different methods, uh, they match pretty closely on the age of the Earth, and carbon-14 dating is not used in general for dating uh, very old things. So thank you. Okay, if I could get my slides on. One of the problems, uh, I think you've been taught all through your education, as, have, as was I and as have many people, that the geologic column is something we can rely on. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting these different rock layers. And you've been taught, and I was taught, that these layers are different ages, and that's simply not true. The things are really dated by the geologic position, and I can show you many examples of what are called polystrate fossils, petrified trees connecting Dr. these layers. Dr. Hoven. The, the intent button? was that, that you both get two and a half minutes to answer the and then question, it's over with? and then we move to a new question. Oof. However, however, you have anticipated the next question, <laughs> <laughs> okay, which was uh, to discuss the geologic column and how okay. it fits into discussions of the age of the okay. Earth. Okay. However, it's Jamin's turn to go well, first. Jamin's turn. Go ahead. Oh. Turn right off. <laughs> okay. So you, do you have a specific question? or I, I don't have a, so much a specific question. Okay. We have several questions up here. They all relate to the geologic column and how this fits into either a young earth or an old earth, that kind of thing. So if you can just kind of take okay. that as a subject. Yeah, um, sure. I'll give, you, I'll give you the extent of my understanding, uh, which is not a lot. So um, the, way that, the way that I've been taught, and yes, I... I do trust some of my education, uh, is that the geologic column is not one of these um, voodoo science areas. There are such areas. Um, I'm afraid that the geologic column is pretty well accepted worldwide. Uh, and it's not just accepted by geologists, but um, it's pretty much accepted by all the major disciplines of science. Um, now, one thing that comes up pretty frequently is uh, what you see in textbooks. And we saw many examples in newspapers and textbooks of bad information that's come out. And here's a news flash. Bad information is often put out. And you know what? That's not necessarily evidence from science. That's uh, oftentimes it's misinterpretation of the facts by journalists, uh, or it's oftentimes the agenda of humanistic um, textbook writers, and it's really not anything, any reflection on the uh, disciplines themselves. So if there's bad information in textbooks, and I haven't seen too many recent textbooks up there, um, I saw a lot of 1960s era, 1970s era examples, but um, if there's bad information in there, there's a good reason for that. Uh, a lot of times they have a, a pretty overt agenda and uh, towards evolution. And I don't believe the geologic column, although reliable, supports evolution. Okay, I get to answer that one, right? Um, the geologic column was invented in 1830 by a guy named Charles Lyell. They gave each of the layers a different name and age and an index fossil, like maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park. The geologic column does not exist any place on planet Earth except the textbooks. The only place you'll find it is the textbooks. Uh, this is a textbook author admits, if there were a column of sediments, no such col unfortunately, no such column exists. And by the way, I have textbooks clear up to 2004, I can reference if you'd like. They all teach this, even today. It's not from the 1960s, okay? If the geologic column existed in one place, it would be 100 miles thick. My question would be, if the layers are really different ages, why are there no erosion marks between the layers? Don't you think it's going to rain once in a while in 10 million years, waiting for the next layer to be set on top? It just simply doesn't happen. The fact of the matter is the geologic column is a joke. It doesn't exist any place. It's based on circular reasoning, and the fossils are dated based upon uh, which layer they're found in, not by potassium argon dating, or uranium lead dating, or any other dating method. Fossils are dated by the geologic position, which is based on circular reasoning. This guy says, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. So your radiometric dating can't even be done without the assumption that the geologic column is correct, and the geologic column was invented in 1830 by Charles Lyell, who hated the Bible and influenced Charles Darwin to turn away from the Bible. So this guy says the rocks date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. I think the cheese fell out of this guy's sandwich is what I think, okay? Uh, 
It's all based on circular reasoning. I cover that in great detail in video number four. So uh, it's sad that students are being taught that the layers are different ages. We have just enormous evidence that they simply are not. As I was going through earlier, the polystrate fossils show, and, uh, and one good experiment is worth a pound of theory any day. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting these layers. I don't think it's logical or scientific to say the layers are different ages, those trees are going to rot and fall down. I think it's much more logical scientifically to say the layers formed rapidly before the tree had time to rot. Now, the Bible says Noah's in the ark for a year. That's plenty of time to deposit thousands of layers of sediment. Thousands of feet of sediment can be deposited in one year. And these petrified trees in the vertical position totally discredit the geologic column. Now, I know the geologic column is, is important to the evolutionist. I know that. I'm sorry. It's not science. All right, our next question is, is similar in the fact that it does touch on geology, and it has to do with uh, meteors, the actions of meteors, atmospheric dust, dust on the moon. These are different uh, conglomeration of different questions up here. Um, one of the questions being that there is a lot of evidence for uh, meteor meteoric activity on the Earth, and if it were compressed into the relatively small period of time of 6,000 years that the explosions that it would have caused would be uh, would be very significant and would threaten life on Earth if, we're, if all these things were compressed into 6,000 years. And I know that some of the people in the audience are also looking for a, maybe we should break this into two questions, addressing uh, meteoric dust, and I know that that's been an, an issue in some uh, debates of this type. So let's break it into two questions. Let's first address um, the compression of meteors into 6,000 years, the meteoric action that's, that there's geological evidence for on Earth. Do we, I'll, Dr. Hogan, if you could take that. Okay, I would point out, go ahead with that. First of all, most comets flying through space and therefore hitting the Earth are simply ice, okay? Uh, which I wouldn't live a pile of dust. Comets are made of rock. There are several types. There's the stony nickel, the nickel, the iron, and the ice. And the vast majority are ice or ice and iron mixtures or ice and stony nickel mixtures. But by far, the greatest majority of even each individual comet seems to be ice, which is why you get this huge tail when it goes near the sun. Uh, they're always blowing off the, the ice particles as they're melting away or being blown out. Um, Comets don't last very long. Less than 10,000 years is the life expectancy of a comet. So the question would be, why do we still have comets? You know, they're still here. They don't last more than 10,000 years. They're flying around. That's another evidence of a young Earth. As far as the evidence of somebody actually compressing the, um, uh, let's see, um, meteor dust, I don't think that's ever been done, to my knowledge. Uh, the existence of comets and meteors is, a, is an enigma to the evolutionist uh, and, the, and the old Earth creationist. I did, I did, yeah, I didn't mean to compress the meteoric dust. What I meant was, is if all the, there, there is evidence of meteoric activity, meteors hitting the Earth, and some of them being very significant and potentially climate changing, all that kind of thing. Um, if all of, if those meteors hit the Earth all within a 6,000 year period of time, wouldn't that have given us a vastly different history than what we have? I think they're starting with the assumption that the Yucatan Peninsula uh, magnetic anomalies represents a giant meteor impact, and it might. Okay, I've been to the Behringer Crater, studied it pretty carefully. There's a large one in Canada, 47-mile diameter uh, crater. But I think uh, a 47-mile crater on an Earth 8,000 miles in diameter is really insignificant. I don't see a problem with the meteoric activity uh, being too great. I believe the Earth was struck by an ice meteor at the time of the flood, and that's what triggered the flood to start. And ice, of course, would make huge pockets and simply melt away and would not create catastrophic events. Um, it flooded the world. Uh, if I cover that in my video number six. So I think it'd be, um, we'd have to have more precise details to even answer the question. You know, like how many, the, how many known meteor craters are there? I would say it's probably of, of any relative size. I mean, the Behringer Crater is only uh, 4,000 feet across, which uh, a meteor the size of this room could have made a 4,000-foot crater. Uh, you know, you can shoot a 22 bullet into the mud and make a hole that big, you know, depending on the softness of the mud. So I don't think it would cause any catastrophic. When the, when the Shoemaker Comet hit Jupiter, everybody worried it was going to end the solar system. It's like a BB hitting a freight train. Nobody's going to know it even happened. So I don't see a problem. Well, actually, um, this, this uh, 
This is a, one of the more curious arguments that I've heard in a while, and I, I think it's quite an interesting one. Um, the bottom line is, if you look at, at the moon, and uh, you know, you can see pretty well what the rate of meteoric activity has been. Um, you can count the craters. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, if you look at, you know, so the Earth and the moon, in either scenario, mine or Dr. Hovind's, are about the same age, uh, so they must have both been undergoing the same kind of meteoric activity. Uh, so you can either spread that out over, in my view, 14 billion years, in which case the Earth can handle that, human life can handle that if it's recent, or you compress all of those meteors falling onto the moon, falling onto the Earth, into 6,000 years, creates complete calamity. It would destroy the Earth, destroy human beings. Uh, this would be a giant wasteland right now. So um, I don't know if there's a lot more to say about that. Um, it seems pretty intuitive to me, but um, that's, I've been wrong before, so. All right, we also have a lot of questions on dinosaurs. Where do dinosaurs fit into each respective uh, old earth, young earth uh, uh, camp presentation? So uh, I believe that Dr. Hoven, you started first the last question. So Jamin, if you could start first this time and address dinosaurs, where they fit in, uh, that kind of thing. Sure. <clears throat> well, I think dinosaurs fit very nicely into the creation account. Um, it was an old creation. Uh, dinosaurs were one of the creatures that were, one of the sp many species that were created. Um, the Bible doesn't specify all the different species. Um, it doesn't say everything but, you know, dinosaurs. It, it, they were all part of God's creation. And uh, many of the animals that were created, actually they all were created before human beings, so um, if there, there were long periods of time involved there, uh, the dinosaurs were created and lived in that period. Uh, I think that they coexisted with the early humans. So that's my, that's my I don't know if I'm addressing the, the right question here. So I, I think they fit neatly in, into the old earth scenario. Okay. Dr. Hovind? Um, I would disagree totally. I think that dinosaurs had to be created on the sixth day with the rest of the animals. Uh, there was no death till Adam sinned. Uh, this guy says nobody's ever seen a dinosaur. Of course, he can't possibly know that. that might, that's his religion, not his science. Oh. The Bible says, God in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that in them is, that would include dinosaurs. God made everything in six days. In my video, too, we talk about what the earth was like before the creation. That would be essential to uh, understand this. But from the creation up until the flood, things were different. The Bible clearly teaches the people live to be 900 years old. I haven't asked Jamin the question, you know, do you really believe this is true? Did they live to be 900? And why don't we today? And how does that fit into the old earth creation view? But if people are living 900 years, it's, a, it's logical to assume that something was different on the planet and probably everything is living longer. Well, reptiles never stop growing. Reptiles grow all their life. It's just a biological fact. A few reptiles maybe slow down or stop, but 99% grow all their life. So before the flood came, reptiles living 900 years would be huge. Dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve. Noah took them on the ark. Probably babies, of course. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. That'd be important later. Uh, but after the flood, people killed most of these dinosaurs. They called them dragons all through history. They're known as dragons. And the word dinosaur was made up in 1841. So Noah took dinosaurs on the ark. After the flood's over, they got off the ark. They faced a different world. Things had changed. And uh, we cover all that in video three. And my computer's slowing down on me here. But yeah, I think uh, it was, I don't see a problem with dinosaurs at all. Matter of fact, I love dinosaurs. Our website is Dr. Dino. My phone number is 479-DINO. We have Dinosaur Adventure Land in my backyard. Um, so we like, but they used to be called dragons. Same animals, though. Mentioned in the Bible 34 times, dragons are. And Leviathan and Behemoth also. Job 40, verse 15, Behemoth, it has to be a dinosaur. It says it has a tail like a cedar tree. It can stop a river. Just read the passage. It's just talking about a dinosaur. All right. Um, I want to move on to, uh, if we can think for a minute about Genesis chapter 1. Uh, on the first day, God created light. I believe it's on the fourth day that he creates or the third day he creates the sun moon and stars 
can we talk about light and uh, in the either the young earth or old earth view, what was this, for example, what would be the source of light uh, prior to the stars and the moon being created? Or do you believe that the stars and the sun and the moon were created uh, on the first day or before the earth, if we can talk about that? Dr. Hoban, you would go first. Okay. I believe the Bible clearly teaches that God is light and he created light before he created the source for the light. I think God preserved his word for us in English in the King James Version. I'm not against going to the Hebrew or Greek, but in the Hebrew there are two different words for light. Uh, one is for the source of the light and the other is for the light itself. In English we have one word light that actually means two things. That is a light and it produces light. Okay, We're limited here. Go ahead and get my slides on there if you would, brother. Uh, days before sun. Um, the Hebrew word or is the word for light. God uh, is light. And then uh, it's used throughout the first few verses of Genesis 1. God made actually light, which is apparently the electromagnetic spectrum. He energized the universe and created all the energy. Then there's a word meor, which means light giver. They have two words for light. We only have one. But you know from the context, you're talking about a different thing. If I say turn on the light, uh, I'm talking about the fixture as opposed to what it produces. Okay, we're just limited in English. And then you can go into the uh, uh, lights. God made lights, greater light to rule the day. And the same thing in uh, all through the Bible. It, it clearly distinguishes. In the Greek, it goes to phos, where we get our word phosphorus for light. But uh, God made the stars, the sun, moon, and stars, well after he made the light. And I think he did that on purpose so we wouldn't worship the sun. The evolution theory and the old earth position clearly teaches that the sun was made before the earth which I think is the, absolutely the opposite of what Scripture teaches. At the end of the book of Revelation, it says they had no need of the sun, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. The Bible starts off the first 13 verses with no sun, but you have light, and it ends up with no sun, but you still have light. I think they're really having a, trying to limit God, that you know God has to have the sun, and God himself is light. The Lord God giveth them light, Revelation 22. Um, God is light. He can make light without a source. He was the light before the sun was made. He'll be the light of heaven long after the sun is gone. He could have created light before he made the sun. So um, let's see. That's my George in there. Uh, there we go. So I, I don't see a problem at all that uh, God could create light before the sun. Uh, and I think that's what the scripture clearly teaches. That's the way he did it. Okay. Yeah. Um, if we look at Genesis 1, um, my reading of this is a little different than that, as you might imagine. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Okay, so chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, his first act is the creation of light, all light, sun, moon, stars included. <clears throat> now, the frame of reference is God looking down on creation, on his acts that he's creating. All light is being created at once. To me, this is the Big Bang. Big Bang, by the way, has nothing to do with evolution. But uh, that's beside the point. The, the Big Bang is just another, another word for me. Uh, God speaking the universe into being. Creation by fiat, by his word alone, and light springs into being. And so you have the sun. You don't have a problem with uh, sun and uh, plants and photosynthesis because you have the sun. But what happens then is the, the uh, frame of reference changes. If you look in verse 2, the earth was formless and void. So the first one, God's up, up above. The earth was formless and void. God changes the perspective down to the earth. Okay, so the entire universe is spoken into being, and then, in my view, the, what we're talking about is looking up through an opaque atmosphere. You can't see the light yet, so God uh, transforms the atmosphere uh, and allows light through, and that allows for photosynthesis. And then, you know, after that, then he creates plants and, and uh, animals and human beings. So, Can we go on on that question some more? Is that, how, do you, how, how, is how about this? another minute each? Okay, whatever. 
Uh, turn right back on if you would. I think this is what he said is in clear contradiction to what the Scripture teaches. Uh, the Bible didn't say God made the light visible in verse 14. It says he made the lights. Let there be lights in the firmament, and let them be for signs and seasons and days and years. And the next verse says he made the stars also. He's not making them visible. He's making them on day three. Uh, so this this is... Um, this is an attempt by the old earth creationists really to, to blend what they've already believed from the evolution theory. They're trying to blend it in with what the scriptures teach. They're not coming to the Bible saying, what does the Bible say? They're taking their scientific baggage that they've been taught and now trying to make the Bible match their current scientific theory. This is abs it's, not, it's backwards to where you're supposed to do it, in my, my opinion. And, and I think we all need to be aware of preconceptions. Uh, we don't want to bring in, um, just because it was taught this way in Sunday school doesn't mean that's ultimately the truth of it. And it's a good way to explain it to a child. Uh, but as we know from many other doctrines in the Bible, many other passages in the Bible, there are many difficulties that we need to explain more fully, more clearly. And so, yes, I believe that this passage is much more complex than it appears in its first reading. Just like uh, many of the stories um, in the Old Testament, many of, well, the uh, death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, there's much meaning there that needs to be sought out and explained, and uh, they're not always readily apparent just from reading it at first glance. We're, we're talking about old earth, young earth, but we're both talking about creation. Why not evolution? Jamin, if you would go first. Okay. Um, I guess the main... The main reason that I don't believe in evolution is because it is so far proven to be absolutely inept at describing the origin and the history of life. Um, there has never been any evolutionist uh, that I've seen that successfully been able to uh, describe the origin of life. So, you know, some of the theories that are out there are just that. Right now we have a lot of uh, the stew of material uh, and just the right amount of um, chemistry in there and just the right amount of electricity in the pond and, and eventually you, you get light. Or, I'm sorry, you get uh, life. And so what the problem there is even by their own mouths, they admit that this is such a long shot. Um, you know, the old monkey and the typewriter, and given enough time, can produce a uh, work of Shakespeare. Um, first of all, there's, there's too much, it's a term called specificity involved uh, with writing Shakespeare. Uh, you'll never get Shakespeare from a monkey, and you'll never get life from a pile of muck. You, you will only get uh, a lot of different mixes of chemicals. So nobody has ever successfully come up with a good explanation of how life began. And um, the second argument that, uh, to me, is very persuasive against evolution is, is the design argument. Um, everywhere we look, there is design that's, been, that's evident. It doesn't matter which branch of science you're in, uh, if, if scientists were trying, especially astronomers, if astronomers were trying to disprove the Bible, they're going about it the wrong way. Everything they, they find, every new discovery, every time they look deeper, points to the Creator, not away. So this is a problem if you're, if you're a naturalist, if you're an evolutionist. And the same is true in the field of biology. Uh, the more we look into the cell, the more amazing design we see, and there's just no way to explain that through natural processes. Uh, we could go into every one of the areas, um, but to me it's, it's most incredible in the areas of uh, astronomy and biology. I would agree that, that everything is amazingly designed, and I think the fact that there are so many things in nature, what are called symbiotic relationships, uh, certain animals require certain plants, for instance. This says it had to be six literal 24-hour days because you got the plants one day and the insects a few other days later. So I think his theory is totally wrong on that there could be long periods of, the days can be long periods of time because of the complexity of biology. As far as using uh, evolution and blending it with what, and saying God did it, the God that would need evolu evolution is cruel, he's wasteful, he's stupid, he's deceitful, he's not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. It's not in the character of God, of the Bible anyway, to use misfits, blind chance, and death. God gets it right first time. 
Jacques Monod said, evolution is a uh, natural selection is the blindest, most cruel way of evolving new species. He said, the struggle for life is an elimination of the weakest is a horrible process. He says, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process God set up to have evolution. I agree. It's not, the teaching of evolution is not consistent with Scripture, and we could talk all day on that. That was Charles Darwin's problem, though. He said in his book, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we're capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, follows. Darwin thought that uh, death and cruelty and struggle for life was the way it was supposed to be. The Bible says God's work is perfect. The world were framed by the Word of God. He spoke it into existence. In six days, he spoke it into existence. It was finished. I mean, it was done. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. It didn't take millions of years. He spoke it. Poof. He spake, and it was done. And he rested on the seventh day. There it is. He spake. Uh, and he rested on the seventh day. And death brought, uh, man brought death into the world. The God that would use evolution is retarded. He can't make it right. And it nullifies the need for the death of Christ. And there's no evidence for evolution anyway. Why would we compromise a perfectly good Bible with a dumb theory like evolution? I see no reason to compromise on that one. Um, the next question has to do with Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, as compared with Genesis chapter 1. And do we need to, to read that portion, or, or are both of you familiar with... Uh, I'm going to go would ahead and read, read it, it to just, just to give it to everybody in the audience. Uh, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the hev earth and heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. I guess the key question here is, is there's, there's a couple of things. Number one, uh, the use of the word day. Uh, and the second thing is, is it seems clear from verse 5 that there, were no, there was no, it says no bush of the field and no plant of the field had sprung up and yet man was created. So it seems as far as an order of creation to be different from chapter 1. Would you, either of you like to address that? Um, actually, I think Jamin went first last time, okay. Dr. Hovind, so you're going to go okay. first this time. Uh, yes, the question of the order of creation nearly tripped me up as a young Christian. A uh, scoffer came to me and said, the Bible says God made the trees on the third day in Genesis chapter 1. He made the fowl, the birds, out of the water in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 20, on day 5. And he made the living creatures, and then he made man last of all. So you got the trees, the fowl made out of the water, the animals, and then man is the sequence. And when you go to chapter 2, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. And people say, see, there's a contradiction. Chapter 1 has the trees before man. Chapter 2 has the trees after man. And then it says, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Here you have two contradictions. The animals and birds are made after man, and the, and the birds are made out of the ground this time, not out of the water. These are the supposed contradictions between chapter 1 and chapter 2. We won't take time in our two minutes to go through all of these here, but I, as a young Christian, I was nearly derailed in my Christian growth because of this very question. Uh, the fact of the matter is, chapter 2 is only describing the garden, and it's pretty clear in the context. Here's the sequence of event, events. On day three, God made the plants. Day five, he made the birds out of the water. Day six, he made the animals. Then he made man. Then he put man in the garden. And then in the garden, he made the trees grow. And he made one more of each animal so that Adam could name them and select a wife. Chapter two is only talking about what happened in the garden. The sequence, this is a, an expansion of the events of day six. I think God made some things in front of Adam on purpose so that Adam could know God did it. If God had made Adam last, Satan could walk up and say, how do you like this garden I made? Adam would have no way of knowing. The fact of the matter is the last thing created was Eve, and that's the one Satan went to. She never saw God create a thing. She had to trust Adam's word and God's word, and apparently she didn't, at least for the moment. But Adam actually saw God create, uh, create things, and so there's no contradiction. It's a continuation of the story. Chapter 2 is only dealing with in the garden. Okay. Uh, again, you know, the relevance of this passage for, for uh, what I'm arguing is mainly that these were generations. These were indefinite long periods of time. And the 
I agree with Brother Hovind here that th this is not uh, the same kind of account of creation as Genesis 1. Uh, so, in, in effect, we agree on much of, much of what he's already said here. Um, I guess the main point is that um, the time frame is obviously much longer, and he, the author is condensing the uh, order of creation quite a bit to get to the point, which is he created man and woman, placed them in a garden, and here are the events that come out of that story. So first one is specifically, Genesis 1 is specifically in reference to uh, what he created and the order of creation and, uh, you know, the actual acts. And then we get into the actual story of, of man. And this is from here on, it's now the account of uh, God and man in the garden. So in verse 5, it, it says, uh, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. So the point is, God created man for that purpose. That's part of the uh, that's part of the story. So I, I hope I'm answering that one correctly. But that's that's how I see chapter two. All right, we're going to move into conclusions. We've about run out of time. Uh, so um, since Dr. Hoven went first in conclusions, Jamin, you'll get to go first, and you get five minutes for conclusion. Thank you. ahead sorry well what we've talked about tonight is um, obviously a very very important issue although not a matter of orthodoxy but it is something that we all care enough about to to come out and and listen to and I hope that um, I hope that we're being informative in this but one thing I would like to point out I'm just gonna have to do this the old-fashioned way here um, many have, have asked, is this issue uh, going to, if I open the door on this, you know, where is it going to lead me? Um, what's next? The virgin birth, the resurrection of Christ? I mean, if I, if I open the door here, uh, it could all come apart. And, and so, I, you know, we've talked about Revelation 7.1, which talks about the, uh, which kind of argues for a flat earth if you're a literalist in that passage. So some Christians over in history have believed that based on those passages, but today we take a less literal interpretation of passages such as this, and there's a good reason for that. We have other information that helps us interpret better. So biblical exegesis, it does not stand completely alone. Occasionally, we bring in other information from outside the Bible, and that's okay to do. Some matters we can't do that on. The resurrection of Christ is completely contained in the Bible. The Trinity is completely contained in the Bible. We don't can't prove the Trinity with math. Um, there's a lot of a lot of examples like that. But on the issues that really uh, go to that are uniquely about creation, that's where we take Romans one at face value and say the heavens are telling, well, Romans, Psalm 19, that the heavens are declaring the glory of the Lord, and Romans 1, we are to look up at that heavens and understand it and discern it. Okay. So what, where that leaves us is this issue can either be an obstacle or a support for us. Um, for me, it was an obstacle for a while, and it has become a dear support to my faith. <clears throat> Every time I take my telescope out and I, and I get in the backyard, I'm there. I am, I am right away. I'm in worship because I see the hand of a mighty God, a God who loves to display his glory in creation. And I believe that that's the right thing for Christians to be doing, to understand it well and to, to lead in that area. So we have two revelations. Can you put this up? We have two revelations. We have... Scripture, which is God's inspired, infallible, authoritative word. And we have the book of creation, God's 
infallible, absolutely accurate display of nature. They are in complete harmony. In 2 Timothy it says, we are to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. So just as we're to be diligent in accurately understanding and uh, handling the word of truth, we also need to be diligent in studying and understanding uh, God's creation. If we fail to do that, if we fail to rightly discern his creation, I think we, we display his glory very poorly. We tell the world this is an area that we are not interested in doing accurately. Now, if you look back at our legacy as Christians throughout history, it's a rich, rich legacy. We have pretty much all of modern science rests on the shoulders of great Christians who advanced science. Uh, Copernicus changed our view of the earth and, and the sun and the planets. Kepler refined that even more and corrected it. Uh, Galileo even further took us further down that path. Uh, many of these men were going up against a lot of opposition theologically, uh, politically. Uh, Newton, Boyle, Pascal, these men advanced science and, and very greatly, and it was tied together with their faith. Now, I'm going to leave you with a quote here, and because I can't say it any better than this, um, but this comes from Benjamin Warfield, uh, who is a, a Reformed theologian from Princeton and a very uh, God-fearing man. Um, hmm? You can't see it. Okay, well, I'll read it. <clears throat> Warfield wrote, We must not then, as Christians, assume an attitude of antagonism towards the truths of reason or science. As children of the light, we must be careful to keep ourselves open to every ray of light. Let us then cultivate an attitude of courage as over against the investigations of the day. None should be more zealous in them than we are. None should be more quick to discern truth in every field, more hospitable to receive it, more loyal to follow it, wherever it may lead. It is for us, therefore, as Christians, to push, push investigation into the utmost, to be leaders in every science, to be first to catch in every field the voice of the Redeemer, the revealer of truth, who is also our Redeemer. All truth belongs to us as followers of Christ, the truth. Let us at length enter into our inheritance. And that's my hope tonight, is that everyone here would leave maybe not persuaded, but at least um, inspired to go forth and study deeper, look deeper into these matters, look at the Bible, look at science, um, do it with joy, experience God's glory through what he's made in the heavens and uh, in the Bible and see how they come together. That's it. Thank you. All right. All right, well, I appreciate you coming out tonight on this uh, chilly evening. The Bible says many are cold and a few are frozen. Oh, something like that. But uh, <laughs> Okay, I think the Bible is abundantly clear on the topic. The Bible says the worlds were framed by the Word of God. By Jamin's interpretation, God spoke real slowly, billions of years. The Bible says he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. To me, that's a rapid creation, not millions or billions of years. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and all that's in them. I don't think you need inter help to interpret that. To me, it can't be spoken more clearly. And this is written by the finger of God on a rock in the Ten Commandments. And he rested the seventh day. There are numerous scriptures. His works were finished from the foundation of the world. He was done. He spoke and he was done. Okay? He's a seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. The Bible's so clear. And about death coming by sin. Man brought death into the world. Not just human death, but animal death came as a result of man's sin. God had to kill two lambs, apparently two animals, to clothe Adam and Eve. Uh, it was animal death that came. By. Man brought all death into the world. There was no death. The Bible clearly teaches in Genesis 1.29 that all the animals were vegetarian before the flood. It wasn't until Genesis 9 after the flood that animals became carnivorous. In Genesis chapter 9, you can read it for yourself. Um, 
The evolution theory, or the Bible and the evolution theory and the old earth position are opposite on many, many counts. The Bible teaches the earth was made before the sun. Jamin says the earth's sun was made before the earth. Uh, the Bible teaches oceans came before the land. The evolution and the old earth position teach the land came before the oceans. Uh, the, that's what the Big Bang Theory teaches. The earth had to cool down from a hot molten mass and then it rained on the rocks for millions of years. So you have oceans coming after land, opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says light came before the sun. The evolution theory and the old earth position teach the sun came before the light. The Bible teaches land plants came first. The evolution theory teaches marine life came first. The Bible teaches the fruit trees were made before the fish. The evolution theory teaches the fish were before the fruit trees, and I would assume the old earth position teaches the same thing. The Bible has fish before insects, and the opposite is true of the other position. Plants before sun, you can read it for yourself. Marine mammals before land mammals. Birds before reptiles. The evolution theory and the old earth position, uh, and the idea that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, teaches that reptiles came before birds. This is not what the scriptures clearly teach. Uh, the Bible puts the atmosphere being made between two layers of water. The evolution theory and the old earth theory have the atmosphere simply above the water without the canopy above. To me, the biggest difference, and by far the most important, the Bible has man bringing death into the world. The evolution theory has death bringing man into the world. Could not be more opposite. I think the scripture is clear. I think the old earth position is a compromise uh, that allows room for evolution theory and neutralizes Christian resistance to the evolution theory. It's a dangerous compromise, in my opinion. Uh, and I think the question of, since God promised he would restore the earth, restore it to what? More death and suffering? More animals tearing the guts out of other animals? I think that is totally not what Christians are looking forward to. I think we're looking forward to a time when the lion shall lie down with the lamb. His position does not teach that. His position teaches the lion has always been eating the lamb. So when God's going to restore it, restore it to what? I think it's inconsistent with Scripture. Uh, I think what we've seen tonight is that there is, uh, obviously, if the old earth position is true, there is a need for everybody to have a guru tell them what the Bible means because you simply are not capable of understanding that book just by reading it. This is how all cults get started, and I think the old earth position is a cult in modern day society. There are many Christians involved in this. You can be wrong on a few doctrines and right on other doctrines. I think it is seriously wrong. I think you need to reconsider that. Uh, people say there shouldn't be a point of contention. I agree. Everybody agree with me, and there won't be an argument. It's real simple. We appreciate you coming tonight. Uh, my position is clear, uh, and I'll go around preaching. It is, uh, those folks who believe the earth is old better get busy because there's a lot of young earth creationists that are pretty busy out there. And uh, my material's in the back, and it's not copyrighted. Spread it around. Thanks a lot. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. Forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, If you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. 
So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad.